Hello, I'm Roger Weatherby, and I'm the Chief Executive of Weatherby's Bank. Uh, Weatherby's is a small uh, private uh, financial services business. We have a private bank. We have a small racing operation. We have an asset finance business and an insurance business. Uh, welcome to Inspiring Leadership. Now, just before I do hand over to Jonathan Bowen Burks, he asked me to do <laughs> some research on, on a whole lot of other people who were all truly inspirational, as far as I can tell. I have no idea why somebody like me has been asked, but over to you, Jonathan. Roger, thank you. It's, it's very characteristically modest of you to say that, but people have told me they find you inspiring lead, uh, an inspiring leader, and so that's good enough for me. It's all by referral anyway. But on the topic, before we go into your life and the work you're doing, Roger, of inspiring leadership, it's a very personal thing how someone interprets that word and they look for the qualities in other leaders that they find to be an inspiring leader. But for you, what does inspiring leadership mean? Well, I think, Jonathan, it's, it's around people, whether you're called chief exec or COO or chairman, you have a title. Um, I think the, uh, and, and you will lead and people will follow because basically they have to. I think the difference between that and an inspiring leader is that irrespective of what your title is, irrespective of your experience, people will absolutely follow you and be inspired by you and, and and basically, that is the key to success. I think, you know, it's a, it's basically, I think that's the secret sauce. Yeah, no, it's a lovely way of putting it. Thank you, Roger. And, and Roger, so here you are, the CEO of the um, Weatherby Banking Group. And uh, you, you've had a fascinating career. You know, we vaguely connected with each other years ago through other mutual friends in your regiment when you were an army officer. And um, also, we're going to have a, a member of your regiment who's going to be coming on soon, Richard Dannett's. Uh, former um, number two, Simon. Um, right. so, so tell us um, about your current role and also give us about five or 10 minutes of your leadership journey that got you to be the leader you are today and who you learned from on the way and the mistakes you made and that kind of thing. Okay. Well, if I may, just to, uh, I'll give you one minute on the, on the history of the business because it kind of puts some of it into context. But uh, we are a private company, 252 years old, seven generations. And in 1770, my ancestor was asked by the jockey club to basically put some sort of uh, formality around horse racing in the UK. Um, and to the extent that basically racehorse owners would have an account with Weatherby's, uh, they would pay their entry fees and other deductions, and then they were credited with any prize money. And, and to, do that, to this day, 252 years later, we're still doing that. His nephew then set up the first ever stud book in the world in 1791. Every thoroughbred horse ever born, alive or dead, in the world today can trace its ancestry back to that stud book. So, you know, so it's quite an extraordinary history. And then the banking business only started 25 years ago but out of the fact that we were running essentially banking accounts in inverted commas for every single racehorse owner or major participant. And, and then we grew that out into a private bank, um, which is 99% non-racing. Um, that We did that about 15 years ago. And as I said, in my intro, we have a 50% part of a personal insurance business and an asset finance business at the racing business. So, so that's, that's basically where we are. And, and I, um, after the army, uh, went off and joined Casanova. Um, and I was incredibly lucky. I spent three years in Sydney. Uh, and then in 1986 and 1989, heady times. Um, then I went to New York with Casanova for three years and then came back to London. And I loved it for 10 and a half years. And I then woke up one morning and, and didn't love it. And so I left um, in, uh, in sort of mid nineties and I was lucky enough to then um, go to London Business School where I did a master's degree in finance and lovely to, to go back and, and brush off those cobwebs and, and to learn. And I by far the stupidest person in the course, everybody else spoke about three languages. So quite a lot of them had an MBA already or a law degree and, and there I was a sort of rather strange sort of ex-army officer, ex-casino, but I absolutely loved it. And then I joined the business as finance director 
and then took over when we knew the bank was beginning to really have potential. I took over running the bank in 2000. So that was my, a very brief yeah. run. Yeah, no, fascinating one. And, and you very uh, modestly quickly skirted over after, after the army. Did the army have quite a positive or even a negative influence on you as far as your, your leadership lessons that you apply in the way you lead as CEO today? What, how did that shape you? And was there anybody you'd like to call out who was really influential as a mentor to you or a role model? Um, the, the army was hugely influential. I, I, like everybody else, joined pretty early. I was only 19 at the time. I'd had, um, so my father was in the war, uh, was, uh, you know, as you know, they never talked about it. He got an MC, he was, he was very young, um, very successful. Um, my, actually, my grandfather was a, um, a full-time career soldier, having got a DSO in the First World War. So there's quite a lot of army history, but it was never really something that I, I thought I'd do. But, but yes, no, I mean, completely changed. It made me grow up. Um, uh, significantly, uh, in a funny way, I'd probably say that my, well, not a funny way, actually, in a, my troop sergeant, uh, now Major Tazy, as it was Sergeant Tazy in those days, you know, brilliant soldier, and, and uh, I poor him for having me as his officer, but, uh, uh, you know, it was that sort of thing, you know, suddenly I was coming out at the age of 23, uh, a bit of a grown-up, and um, having had some fun at the same time. Yeah, and, and let's talk about um, Sergeant Tazy. Because this happens a lot in the army and doesn't really happen in business where a young leader is given an experienced, um, hoary, salt of the earth kind of guy who will tell him what the troops will and won't understand and how not to be such an idiot uh, and what to do in the right way and how to how to make sure to look after and to lead well in a way because he's been all the way through the ranks himself. So he knows what works and what doesn't. Um, how important is that in, in the military? And then, and then what's your thought? Is there anything we can do like this in business? Because so often I see leaders get promoted and there's no help for them at all. They're just promoted, crack on, new job. No, no induction, nothing, no training, no go away for a course at London Business School, nothing. Yeah, no, I mean, I think there's a huge amount to learn. And I think what we, we've done at Weatherby's and elsewhere is we tend to promote somebody who's really good at their job. And then you say, you're incredibly good at your job. You're now going to manage three people or six people, you know, get on with it. And, um, and, and we haven't got that. We've actually just introduced uh, a much more rigorous program called the Weatherby's Academy, which is going to try and, and get around this sort of issue. Um, but, but getting people, you know, we, we're lucky enough to have people who, who work with Weatherby's for, 25, 30, 35 years. I mean, it's extraordinary longevity. Um, and we need to, and that, and what they've got is the culture and the ethos absolutely running through their, their veins. And, and I think that's an important part of who we are and we need to, to share that. Yeah, no, it's, it's a very good point. And, and anybody you, apart from the troop sergeant, anybody else about, among the officers that you'd call out who, who you're still in touch with now or you remember fondly and, and what qualities was it that made them inspiring leaders to you? Um, gosh, my squadron leader, uh, Michael Harris, a very, very intelligent officer. Um, uh, probably shouldn't have been an officer in a funny way. He probably should have been a scientist or an engineer. Uh, obviously, I'm going to have to say Simon Mayer if he's coming in a couple of, <laughs> couple of episodes time. Um, you know, and then in a funny way, you learn a lot from your, your peers, don't you? You know, and I think they're the ones, you know, who could, you know, when you're going off the track, they're the ones who, you know, they've been there a couple of more years before and they can turn around to you and say you're an idiot. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you, you learn from that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's a very good point. I, I certainly was called an idiot more than more than my fair <laughs> share of times. Um, and now that uh, you, you've had this experience and you look over your career thus far, um, and you and I are a, a similar age, so it's a good time to reflect on life. In your life, what were your proudest moments, perhaps business and, uh, and work, and what was your darkest moment in your personal life and, and in, your, in your business life? Um, 
Well, as you say, this is a sort of business podcast, and you know, I probably should say something like the way that we recently won the best private bank in you know, the ward, um, constantly bumping into clients who say how much they love what we do. Clients write to us and say how much they love what we do. Um, but also other moments, you know, I, I um, managed to walk to the South Pole dressed in the same kit as Scott in 19... <laughs> so sort of full tweeds and, and, uh, and seal skin boots and... Uh, that that was a wonderful moment. I I climbed. Before you go of... any further, before you go any further, that's just like <laughs> such such a sort of dinner party kind of going. Yeah, I walked to the South Pole, and that was a lovely Roger way of throwing it away. I mean, massive event to walk to the South Pole. Were you not frozen in that gear? Because it isn't sort of all the modern day gear. What d- didn't you almost die of hypothermia? And no, no, no. Oh. I mean, quite the opposite actually. I and mean, what was extraordinary was. Was and the, and the funniest story was, of course, we wanted to raise a lot of money for charity, and 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 our, the sort of guide said, "Well, you're you're going to need an edge." So so that was our edge, and we had the same sled, the same tents. The, we had sleeping bags made of reindeer skins, um, et cetera, et cetera. But having got got there, and then come back to the to the base, we all got into the modern kit, and completely independent. Three or four hours later, we were sort of wandering around. Could, We've been in a tent for a long time together, so we thought we'd have some time off. But we all got together again, and we were all back in the old kit. It is so good. The wool, the fur, such a... Because otherwise, you sweat, and, and it, that's and the sweat makes you cold. And, and so, yeah, no, it's a, a fantastic. I, I would highly recommend it. Wow, an amazing thing. And also, that touches on something which is very lovely, uh, uh, and I really admire about you, and we'll touch on it in legacy and, and things like that, but... You're a great believer, literally, not only in being a steward, as chairman, but a stewardship and philanthropy and, and leaving things better than you found them. So could you give an indication of, of who you were raising money for? And can you remember what you raised? Yes. Yeah, so we raised just uh, over £400,000. Wow. Uh, and uh, uh, one of my colleagues um, has a son who was born with cerebral palsy. Um, so we were raising money for that. Uh, and then an, another one of my colleagues um, lost two children who were born very premature. So we were raising money for um, incubators in NHS hospitals. Mm. Um, so that was, and then, and then I was involved uh, in latter day chairman of, of, a, of the big overall racing, horse racing charity that looks after all the people in stable lads and lesses and racing. So we raised a little bit of money for them as well. Well done. Um, and it, yes, it was it was extraordinary, an extraordinary amount of money as well, and and uh, you know, we were very pleased to do it. So. Yeah, and and uh, do you ever find yourself thinking back to time in the Arctic, uh, Antarctic, uh, and and that walk, and I don't know any lessons that you took for life from it because it's a huge event in anybody's life. I mean, what was extraordinary is we all slightly went thinking that we would come back with amazing business ideas and come back. You know, highly entrepreneurial, come up with new ways of doing things. The trouble is, it is so cold that your brain slows down, even even slower than it normally does for me. But um, and and you couldn't really think through stuff very succinctly. Um, but what we did do is when we came back, our, I think our, our other halves were you know were amazed how how mellow we were, mm. complete lack of stress. Obviously, there's I mean, there's, I mean, there's nothing there. There is, there is no sound. There are no animals. There's no insects in the middle of the, you know, the continent. And uh, you know, rushing about, getting stuck in a car jam, and just going, well, what's the rush? You know? And uh, sadly, that didn't last. But, but if that was one lesson, I wish I had been able to keep, then it would have been that. Yeah, but doesn't it make you realise how how addicted we are? Sugar, alcohol, whatever. <laughs> drugs of use people use but but to the busyness and the digital age and technology and checking our phones and social media and it, it is so addictive isn't it but then when you're there and you can't do that it really aside from the fact it's so cold it, it affects your thinking you really can be more present with yourself and each other oh completely completely i mean you know i and, and i'm so slightly 
you know, you were asking about the proudest moment, and and, and rather glibly, I, I I wrote down that you know the proudest moment was when I actually remembered or realised actually what is important in life, and uh, and I think you know you eventually having worked so hard and you know for so many different reasons and career promotion you know reward you actually you've got to get it right and having a happy fa- being healthy and having a happy family is actually the most important thing and and when i remember when i realized that was what it's all about then then i sort of kind of scales drop from my eyes so health and happy family would be the big wake up call. It, it, it's it sounds simple, but it's it, it's at the essence of everything. And and I relate to that, Roger, because my my uh, middle brother David died a few months ago. Uh, suddenly, about three years older than you and I, uh, he was diagnosed, and ten weeks later, he was dead of metastatic cancer. It had gone everywhere: brain, back, legs, arms, uh, and that puts everything in perspective. And therefore my one remaining brother, I want to spend as much time as I can with him. And he got attacked by a psychopath who tried to stab him to death. So um, it it makes me treasure that and certainly treasure my wife, our four children. We've now got two grandchildren. So I really relate to that. Is is that the big things, happiness and and the family? Yeah, I mean, it it has to be because, uh, you know, we, you know, you were talking about social media and being busy and you know, we know that we're on this, this, this sort of treadmill, you know, and, and particularly I think with social media being always on, you know that we're, you know, we all know we're checking our phones too late at night, we're checking them first thing in the morning. You know, it is, it can, you know, it's not right. And, and we've got to remember what we're, what we're doing this all for. Mm. And, um, you know, we don't want to be, you know, lying on our deathbed saying, I wish I'd spent more time with the family or I wish I'd done that earlier. There's no point keep putting it off, putting it off. Yeah. Uh, you know, otherwise, you know, what's the point? Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I was reading recently uh, two two books, uh, audio books, because I'm dyslexic, so I read um, read those. And um, uh, what I'm just going to just look them up now. One was um, Four Thousand Weeks by Oliver Berkman. Yeah, I've read that. Yeah which I found profound. And the other one was by Kate Bowler, which is called No Cure for Being Human. And she had cancer and it was gonna be terminal, I think it was, it was uh, pancreatic or bowel cancer. I can't remember, colon cancer maybe. Um, she actually is still alive, remarkably some seven years after they said she was gonna die within a few weeks, uh, they did some, uh, they found a particular approach, but so many of the others who she was with, they all died. And, and it puts everything in perspective, I find, Roger. It really does, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, okay, so so from those proud moments, walking to the South Pole, the, the, um, the bank and its awards and the lovely feedback that your colleagues at the bank get from your customers, that's great. What about dark moments in, in personal life and, and in, in work and what you learned from both of those? Um, well, my my example probably well, it is, well, it is well, well from personal life. I, I my my wife had been a huge has and is a huge support for me, and I think a lot of those of us who 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 managed to achieve sort of high positions, you know, very much rely on our other hearts. Um, and 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 she was bringing up four children, so we. We've got four children as well. They're they're five years apart, so we did have four children under the age of five, which was <laughs> wow. which was quite interesting, um, but great. Anyway, recently she had an issue which she needed my support on, and and I didn't give it to her, you know, and and uh, and that I I regret, and and you know I let her down, and you know, and I was very, and I should have done, you know, it was just just absolutely you know weak of me and. You know, I did, just didn't support her having her supported me all my life. So that was, you know, that was a big learning. And and again, it, it just reass- you know, it means you focus. You know, where's your focus? Is it? Yeah. Are you focusing on the right thing? Yeah, it's it's a very good point. And um, uh, when we die, and I went to a funeral the other weekend, um, friend Rodney who died at seventy two of pancreatic cancer and I knew him and liked him well. He'd been my scout master, he'd been a family friend. He'd been there for me when my mother was dying of uh, 
Um, she had a stroke, uh, two, two strokes and died of the second one. But he was always very supportive. And it was, it really put it in context. What does matter is the family and friends. And, and at the last moment, who's talking about you? It's probably a, a son or a daughter, uh, surviving spouse if they can speak, uh, because they're probably quite choked about it. And, and good friends. And the inbox is still full. <laughs> the inbox is still full. Um, looking back to when you were age 16, Roger, uh, if you could travel back in the DeLorean, what bit of advice would you say, Roger, this matters, but this really doesn't matter. Don't worry about that. What, what advice would you give to yourself? And, and therefore, it might be useful to other people who are listening who've got sons at the same age. Um, gosh. Uh, I think my advice would be to seize every opportunity. Um, and I have been lucky in that I have um, been able to do a lot of that. I, I had a very busy time in the army where I did jungle warfare and Arctic warfare and I traveled to the Sinai and then I went on Operation Raleigh to Honduras, taught some of the people to to water ski with a pair of jungle boots nailed to a plank of wood. Um, so that was all good fun. And then, you know, and I've, as you said, you know, as you know, sort of the South Pole and various other little trips. Um, and, and just, I think, really seize every opportunity. I love that adage, um, you know, you can, you can sleep when you're dead. Um, I don't think you would try not to have any regrets. Um, and my dad was great. He, he said, look, you know, we have a family business, you know, if you want to join it, great. But if you don't, it's not a problem. If you want to be a sculptor, you want to be a doctor, you want to go and live in the middle of Africa, that's what you must do. You must never, ever turn around and think, you know, I wish I'd done that or I wish I'd tried that. Um, so I think that would be my advice. Follow your heart um, mm. and, and try and squeeze every every drop out of life would be my would mine. Yeah, well, you, you certainly have. And I think... I, I count myself lucky that I've done the same in my own way. In fact, as part of my 60th, I'm in a month's time heading off to see clients in America and then going down to Peru with a bunch of other guys in uh, a, a, a leadership program called Unleash Your Humble Alpha by two other the podcast guests I've had. Uh, one was a tank commander in the second Iraq war. The other one was a Green Beret in the US military. And they run this great program which involves doing the ayahuasca and the San Pedro ceremonies and um, <laughs> the hallucinogenic effect to, to actually sit down and think what, what is important in life. And I've actually luckily worked through a lot because you can't hope to help anybody else that is sort out your own shit, as they say. And um, I, I feel very together on that. But it's nice taking with me a, a tornado pilot from the first Gulf War, a friend of mine, Adam. And... Um, uh, also uh, a number of other leaders. So, so I think that that will be quite special. Never been to South America. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Let, great. Let's go around the Inspiring Leadership Compass next, Roger. Um, th th this we find from our research, you know, what, what makes high-performing leaders and teams. And while there's never the perfect leadership model, or I think it's just quite a useful one to have a conversation around because it does seem to contribute strongly to people's success in, in life and, and in their work. The first one is MQ, moral quotient. So, so what would be your top three values and principles you've been brought up and you live by that have stood the test of time? Um, and, and what do you do when you let them slip and how you get yourself back on track, as it were? Um, I'd have to say, first and foremost, integrity. Mm. Um, you know, I think I think if you lose that or you don't have that or, or you know you fall off that track, I think you know you're it's pretty difficult to get back. Uh, so it's integrity in the personal life, and then integrity is very much part of the DNA and what we try and you know what our ethos is and, and the values of the business. I'm doing the right thing all the time, um, and the, and then people recognise that. I think it's a very true one. Um, Positivity, optimism, I think, you know, you've got to, you know, I'm very much a half full sort of guy and, and uh, you know, I like that. And, um, and then I suppose just as we were chatting before, you know, adventurous, really, I think, um, try something new. 
um, and uh, yeah, push push the boundaries. Mm. That's great. And, and, and from that, the next one round is PQ, meaning and purpose, you know, people's vocation, their calling. You talked about uh, before you went to LBS, you sort of woke up one morning and this wasn't what you wanted to do. It didn't give you any fun anymore. Um, how do you work out what is your life calling and why you should? I mean, clearly the, the walk to the South Pole really helped you work out what matters. But, but why do you do the work you do? You didn't have to do this. You could have done something else. But, but what gives you that fulfillment and sense of meaning and purpose in your life? Well, I mean, I think for us, it, it is quite, you know, well, it's a little different because you know, we have this, you know, it, you know, it is a family business. Um, and, and that, I think, has been a big part of, of what I, you know, why I do what I do. My... My dad, we, my, my dad's family was sort of cousins. They weren't the main family. And, and, and sort of like they used to in the old days, if you were an impoverished cousin, I think the first, the eldest son of my grandfather as it was, was allowed to join my uncle. And dad was sent off to the you know, choice of the city or the church, I think. <laughs> um, and went off to the city and was a very successful stockbroker. Um, and as I said, he never, he said that you must never join unless you really want to. But he left the city in 73 um, because the main racing business was, was, was on very, very rocky um, foundations. And basically he came and rescued it. And so there is this sense of family and values and, and, and you know, it has been so good to us, the business. Um, and so many of our team and all our colleagues are so loyal that there is very much a, a piece to try and keep the business going, make one a little bit more successful and then hand it over to the next generation. And not just the next generation of, of family, but the next generation of, of our colleagues and, and some of those who've been, been with us for a very, very long time. And the next generation of clients as well. I mean, some of our clients have been with us for pretty much the same number of generations as, as we. So th that's a big sort of part of it and a big part of the backbone. Um, the next piece around purpose is, is that we, we, we've started this thing called the Creating the Future initiative and that started with me wanting to talk to our customers as adults and, and have a an really intelligent conversation about the future yes we can do current accounts yes we can do deposits and checkbooks and like any other private bank but you know we all can do that and if you can't do that quite frankly you shouldn't even be kind of around so it was very much trying to, to bring together some really interesting people, stimulate some discussion, stimulate some thought, and then use all of our contacts and all of our clients to try and make a bit of a difference. And, and that has become, we're in quite early stages, but I think that's become a, my next sort of stage in driving forward, having a proper conversation. And, 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 and we, you know, today, with everything going on, whether it's happening in, in Ukraine and Eastern Europe and whether it's happening in, in um, you know, the environment. You know, like one of our clients said, you know, if we're not going to have a grown-up conversation now, when will we ever do so? So that, that's what I'm doing in the future. That's fantastic. Well, look, congratulations on that. Please keep it going. We need it more than ever. Um, the next one, which is a, a key one, which many leadership models miss out, is the health quotient. And um, it's the physical, as you would expect, and interested in your tips on that. But I'm particularly interested in brain health, not mental health. It shouldn't be called mental health. It should actually be called brain health. Because if your brain is healthy, then many benefits come from that. And I partway through listening to The End of Mental Illness by Daniel Arman, which is an excellent audio book, uh, are really about the kind of things to do. And, and the fact that, isn't it amazing that if you injure your knee or your back, you'll have a scan or you, you've got a, um, a, a severe problem with your stomach, they'll put you through an MRI scanner or something like that. But if you have a problem with the brain, they go, ooh, uh, I think you need some pills or mm, it's probably this without checking anything out. And his point is he has a, a scanner which looks at blood flow and what might be going on in the brain. So I, I think the whole area of mental illness is, is really better talk to brain health. What, what did you do for your brain health, uh, apart from going to the South Pole once in a lifetime? <laughs> um, 
Well, I did another little trip where I rode two horses from the bottom of Spain to just south of Paris. Wow. That was about three months, riding one and leading one. And then I had a few mates come and try and ride the other one. And, uh, and then the following year, I, I did actually ride across the top of Pakistan, on, but just on one horse. Wow. On one. But, you know, that's, you know, that's, these are all great trips. But, you know, in terms of brain health, I think you're right. But it, it is, as we were talking before, it, it, you know, sleep well, keep fit. But it always it is around stress, isn't it? One, it's around putting what's important in the right order. Um, you know, you've got to be able to laugh. You know, and laugh a lot. You know, and work. You know, if we spend if we spend most of our lives working, you know, it might as well be fun. Um, because if you're not having fun, and you're entirely stressed out, entirely exhausted, and you make a lot of money, what are you going to do with the money? Well, quite frankly you're probably going to be dead, you're not going to enjoy it. And, you know, maybe your children will enjoy it instead. You know, so I think, you know, it's so easy to say, and I haven't got this completely right by any means, but it's so easy to say and pretend that, you know, yes, we're all going to give, it, give up. And, you know, when we're, we're on our careers, we're, we're reaching the top, it's a very exciting time, you know, but you've got to be able to stop or at least come back. And, and remember what's important, and is it whether that's family or health? There's no point having millions of pounds if you're not healthy. Yeah. And and as you say, you doesn't matter how physically fit you are, if your if your brain and your mind is in the wrong place, it, it's got to be the same. So stress. Our business is also um, designed. We've designed the bank to be very conservative, not just because. Well, one of the things is we've got six generations of ancestors, and I don't want to be the one woken up by six generations of ghosts going, you're the ones who upset it all. So we, we design it basically for a good night's sleep. Very low credit risk, huge amounts of liquidity. Don't take on any clients or any type of business that we think might, you know, might ruin the reputation of the business. If your gut says no, don't do it. If in doubt, don't do it. Mm. So, so we sort of designed it not to have, to try and be as worry-free as possible. Yeah. And I, and, and I don't want to be woken up at two o'clock in the morning by somebody shouting at me. And I certainly don't want my staff, or my team being woken up by some rude customer. Mm. Life's too short. Yeah. So, yeah. so that, that's my sort of HQ piece. Yeah. No, I think it's, it's, a, it's a really good one. Thank you for that. Uh, and linked to that, but it, it, in, in relationship terms, and relationships are key to our mental, our physical health, our brain health. Um, uh, what, what tip would you pass on to people? You're having to get on, not having to, you choose to uh, get on with people everywhere from all sorts of walks of life. And good relationships and rapport building is a skill you have, I know, from, from visiting you at the bank some years ago. What would be your tip on emotional intelligence that you'd pass on that, that really works for you um, and for others? Well, for, for me, I mean, I've always, well before I was involved in business, have sort of tried to see the good in people. Um, you know, I think we often see somebody and they're acting... You know, they either come across incredibly arrogantly or whatever, and people, there's no way to reason. You know, I'm generalizing here, but you know what I mean. You know, they're either very shy or they're very unconfident. They come across completely in the wrong way. I think there's always probably a reason behind it. And so I always try and give people the benefit of the doubt. Now, you know, maybe as a leader, you know, that's, you know, you, we imagine we have to be tough and strong and, and, you know, beat our fists on the table, but that doesn't work for me. This is my style. I don't, I try and get uh, people to at least smile when I uh, want to tell you what I think they ought to be doing. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a lovely tip. And, and really from emotion terms, there's natural flow into the next principle, which is about cultural intelligence and uh, community and collective intelligence and teams and things you know there you are you you, you rode from the, the southern tip of spain all the way up to paris through through a couple of nations there in pakistan uh, and then in the many different people that you deal with in the racing world from from many nations 
what, what's been your tip on on getting on with people who are very different from you? They didn't go to Eton. They didn't. They don't, didn't serve in the army. They're, they're very different from you. But you have. I've seen you. You have that ability to get on with almost anybody from any background without being judgmental about them. What's the tip you'd pass on? Um, smile and listen. Mm. Let them talk about themselves. Let them tell you a story. Let them tell you about your family, their family. Um, you can talk about business later that night, the next day, a couple of months later. But it's about building up that rapport, isn't it? Yeah. It's, 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 so true. And and uh, there's a, a book I read or, or listened to a while ago called Life is in the Transitions, that we, we have some highs and lows in our life. Uh, and we often think I'll get on with life when I get through this transition. But actually, the real bits of life are in those transitions, those really challenging moments. And so everybody's got a story with transitions. So I, I found in that he gathered stories from people. And, and it has undoubtedly been the course of my easiest success in business particularly with this podcast now you know we're 210 episodes um i've i've learned people's stories and i've really enjoyed hearing their stories and as you say when you relax into it and you're genuinely interested in them their family their story what makes them tick later on business can be done but but you've got to build a trust and people don't they go transaction they go straight in for the jugular and People are very wary, and it's a transactional relationship, which is very fragile, don't you find? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that brings up the other thing around time and patience. You know, it, it, you know, you know, I think in generations before and businesses and of our parents, grandparents and before, people took time to build the relationships. And when we, for example, set up the bank, we, you know, we told everybody, look, you know, we're a brand new bank. You know, why would anybody want to bank with us? And I'm we came up with this idea of being very much like, unlike any other bank. We listened to people and we genuinely said to them, listen, you know, we've been around for 250 years, you know, eventually you, you know, we will do some business together. And if the worst comes to the worst, my children will do business with your children. We genuinely are not in a rush. And it wasn't a sales technique, it was the truth. And, and, and because they really, because they believe it, because it is the truth, then they started trusting us. They gave us a, a lot more business with us a lot earlier on than we ever could have imagined. I think we just have to, of course, we're all in a rush today. But I think if we could all learn to be a little bit more patient, um, then it would come right. You know, it's, you know, we see it in the investment world, don't we? You know, quarterly results and, you know, you, it doesn't work, business doesn't work like that. No, we're I, brave I, I, enough to be patient. You're so true. And there's a there's a lovely um, fintech organization that I work with and they're doing terribly well. Uh, became a unicorn, got listed on the NASDAQ. And there's always the pressure. You know, they've only been listed for a few months. And there was that pressure. Where's your numbers? Where's your numbers? Why, why isn't your share price higher? And they go, we've got to play this in a longer game. And we mustn't change our values and the way we are with each other and the way we are with our customers because we want the dollar for this month. Um, we've got to do the right thing for long term, but it's very difficult when capitalism and the whole setup of it rewards short termism and the Goldman Sachs banker beating you up to grab as much as he can to get the Ferrari before someone works out that his mortgage backed securities are not triple A, but actually A with lots of ease. I don't know. I, 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 I tease uh, a particular organization. I'm sure it's um, many stand guilty of that. Um, resilience. Um, how have you picked yourself up in times of adversity when, when things haven't worked out? And, and what have you learned from that, which you'd pass on as a tip to others? Um, I would say that, again, trying to remember what's important, mm. if possible. You know, I think um, you know, putting, putting things in the right order. You know, as you said, you know, if it's you lost your bonus or you lost your car or you've lost the holiday or, you know, get it, get, get, get it right. You know, if your family are healthy and, and whatever, I think that that helps. And, and, and of course, and the other, I mean, the main, I, 
we've all the only thing the only times i've ever learned something is when i've done it wrong really mm. <laughs> and you try and learn from from that mistake so it's quite easy to say it now but try and say that that was a learning experience you may be feeling a complete idiot and, and a real fool and embarrassed but but it is a learning experience yeah i i agree with you there was a wonderful uh, professor from the university of michigan who uh, trained me in one of the big big banks and and he used the the term teachable moments that when something doesn't work out what have you learned and what are you going to do uh, and this learning and action is such a lovely approach um, that i've tried to embody myself and encourage the ceos and the businesses i work with not to be so harsh but to ask that uh, when it's not worked out what have you learned and what are you going to do come and see me tomorrow with your plan and, and that way, they've actually done much better from it than, than even just recovering from it. They've actually made more money and everybody's learned from the process. I, I like that. Um, the last two are brand and then legacy. Um, brand, uh, how, how have you found out about your brand, Roger? I mean, you know, a bit like the Queen, when you go to places, everything smells like new paint and all the loos are brand new. You know, how, how do you make sure you get 360 feedback on you that, allows you to learn from it and, and grow? Well, I mean, that's absolutely the, the, the key issue is, is that when you are the CEO and your name is the one above the door, you know, I, I just, you know, you very rarely get good, honest feedback from, you know, particularly when things are not going right or, or you've made a poor choice. Um, therefore, my, my number one, critic there is my wife mm. <laughs> who tries to keep my feet firmly on the ground and and, and get dispel any any potential of, of, of hubris um and i think you know that that piece around what what she says and what's a, what i love is that, that you don't be defined by the business what you were saying before when you're you know you're in the box and your friends are talking about you you know it's a, hopefully they're talking about you and not you know oh they were you know, their business went up by 25% compound growth over the last 15 years. You, you very rarely hear that in a, in a eulogy, don't you? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. But... It, 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 is, it does. It does. Uh, and, and I think it, it's who you are as a person. It, it's um, in the funeral, the son, who was a vicar, gave Rodney a wonderful, uh, a wonderful send off. Uh, it was funny, it was sad, it was very moving. But, but he said, his question, well, what is the measure of the man? And he would then talk about the measure of him. Uh, and, and then another story, what is the measure of the man at the end of the day? And I, I found that very profound. And, and also, it is quite interesting with other CEOs, when I do 360 feedback with them, I get their wife to be one of the people who fills in the form and who I interview. And, and sometimes if the children are older, the children too. Um, and then peers. Uh, and then if there's, you know, uh, non-executives or trustees or whatever they might be. But a range of different people because they say different things to me than they do to the CEO. Okay. They always do. And, and, and I, I'm interested in people and just ask the question, like, just tell me more. Or, or the, the door handle close, which is that lovely one, which I'm sure you come across is, as literally as you're saying, thanks so much indeed. And they're heading out of the door. Their hand is on the door handle. And you go, oh, is there anything else I should know? <laughs> and you just stay quiet and, and they just out it comes. Oh, well, there was a bit of a problem of embezzlement of funds, but not, not really a big problem. <laughs> but I'm, I'm making that up. No one has actually said it. <laughs> but there was a story in our days. Um, in Cyprus, when I was with the Scots Guards and your regiment was, was out there. Um, the, uh, the CEO who I, I chat to later on, he did the same thing. He was saying goodbye to a sergeant in the electronic warfare regiment, 9 Sig regiment. And he, he'd been there for three years and been a hero and sportsman and all sorts of stuff. But they'd had a major drama where all the codes of the Russians and the Syrians and everybody else had changed overnight and they couldn't listen in to them anymore. They didn't know what had happened. Anyway, he was just curious about this. And the Sergeant Major marched him in for his farewell interview. And he said, so, so Sergeant Jenkins, you know, thank you very much for what you're doing and good luck. I know you're going to the regiment in Germany and I hope that goes well. 
And he said, goodbye, sir. And he saluted. He, he was grabbing the door hand. He said, oh, Sergeant Jenkins, before you go, is there anything else I should know? And the sergeant went quiet, utterly quiet, didn't know what to do. And then he went, yes, sir, I've been spying for the Bulgarians. <laughs> and he went, uh, Sergeant Major, can you just come in a moment? <laughs> Take a seat. <laughs> and they, it, it all unraveled. It all came out from there. Uh, so the door handle close is an amazing one. And it, it's a great one, of course, as well for when you're doing, let me just do a few references. A, a reference always needs the conversation and it always needs the door handle close. Um, legacy. Then we'll talk about executive teams, your favorite book, and then the top tip. Uh, legacy, you know, you're a man who, who's done a phenomenal amount of philanthropy. You, you're leaving the bank for the next generation, you know, for, for the eighth generation. Hopefully there's somebody in the family who'll be there. But, but what would your tip be on legacy and personal life and in work? Um, well, uh, this, this, I've been thinking about this, but you know, as you say, you, you know, the fact that we've handed over or, or will hopefully hand over a, a stronger and bigger business, and, and in terms of the bank, pretty much a new business, um, you know, is fantastic. Um, a happy family. What I did here, I love the story where I told, turned around to a friend of mine who's a third generation, uh, quite a successful investment business, and they were handing it over to their two sons who worked in the city and were sort of coming back to run the business. And I said, do you, you know, how do you ensure that this business, you know, is going to be run like you want, you know, like, like you run it and, and, you know, how do you ensure they're not going to flog it the next day and da, da, da. And he looked at me and said, well, you know, I'm not going to mind really. I'm going to be dead. <laughs> you know, it's, it's out of my, it's out of my hands. You know, all I could have done, and all I have done is brought them up well, hopefully with, 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 with the right values. And then it's up to them. You know, you can't rule from, you can't rule from the grave. I think that's, that's probably worth, worth thinking about. Uh, I love that. Can't rule from the grave. I won't mind, I'll be dead. Um, <laughs> so you, you've spent a lifetime building teams, being in teams, um, traveling on your own, but yet having to build teams as you go along with, with people to collaborate with you and help you. And now, of course, the way you've taken the family business and created over that time, you know, so many new offerings around sort of the banking and the, and the private bank. Um, when you've had a toxic team or a toxic individual in a team, what have you done to turn it around and get it high performing what would be your tip to people who are listening and going i've got this real problem what do i do about this guy or this woman um so i read a great book and it was it was talking about a bus you know you're either on the bus or you're off the bus and you want some people you know you want people to get on the bus and then be part of the journey um some people won't want to get on the bus and some people are on the bus and you want to get them off um I, in these instances, will, will get the person off the bus. Um, I think that you can try very hard to turn them around. I think in a, in a relatively small organization, one individual can have such um, control or such sort of power because you, um, that, and it takes up so much management time. I think we, we in, my, in my view, we don't have that, that spare resource to really take on one individual. So, so I think if they want to be on the bus and they want to be part of the journey, I will bend over backwards to help them and develop them and put them on the right track. But if in their heart of hearts they're in, you know, they, they're gonna, you know, then it's better to get them out. And as we all know now, that tends to cost quite a lot of money, but it's, it's cheap at the price. Um, the other instances we've had is when, when somebody knows they're in the wrong place. Uh, it's happened once or twice where we've promoted somebody um, because they've been great at their job, but to be honest, they were over-promoted and they feel really uncomfortable. They know they can't really do the job. They wanted the promotion for the title, to be proud, to 
you know, as part of their career, but they know they can't do it and, and they struggle. And then when you tell them it's not for them, yes, anger, etc. But very shortly after that, they they almost thank you. They know they were in the wrong place. And now they've got an opportunity to do something they really want. Yeah, it's, it's so very true. Time and again, I, I've had it where people were perhaps upset at the time, but afterwards they came and they said, look, thank you. I, I just, I was not happy there. And, and as someone said, and I love the term, let me help you find your happiness elsewhere because it's not here. You're not happy. I can tell you're not happy. I'm not happy. You're not happy. What are you going to do about it? It's your life. It's not sustainable to carry on the way it is. So what are you going to do? I think that's very true. They often wait to be rescued by someone else. Everybody knows it's not working. And it, it's the, another CEO said to me, Jonathan, when you know this, if you ask them, if, you know, what will you know in 12 months time that you already know now? I said, I know they won't make it. He said, well, why are you waiting 12 months? Uh, yeah. be, be firm in the decision and be kind in the execution. Help them leave with the dignity with which they joined, but, but help them find their happiness elsewhere. That's great advice. Thank you for that, Roger. Um, last, penultimate question, favorite book on leadership? Uh, wh which one would you choose and what was it you would recommend to others why it's a good read or a good listen, hopefully, uh, for me? Well, if, if I'm allowed, just two. Um, start with why. Yeah. Simon Sinek, that would probably quite one that's probably been quoted before, but but very much, you know, love that book. Love that book. Really gets to where what we at Weatherbees are trying to do. And then the other one, which I um, discovered about eighteen months ago, is is the future is faster than you think. Oh, okay. And that is Peter Diamandis and Stephen Kotler. Um, you know, sometimes people turn around and say, gosh, you know, this, you know, very traditional private bank and traditional firm that's been involved for hundreds of years. You know, we have a, you know, there is quite, there is no doubt that any organization that stops looking forward will die. And, and quite frankly, you cannot survive 250 years if you're not constantly looking to try and innovate and look forward. Um, and, and this book is around about this, the pace and the increasing pace of change in technology mm. and whether, and, 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 you know, what might have taken 10 years will now take one year and what might take next year, a year will probably take a couple of months in 10 years time. We cannot afford to sit around without changing. Mm. I, I that's really good. Really good. I'm going to, I'm going to get that and have a, have a read. Thank you for that. So, Roger, we come to um, the final two minute top tip. Would you just kind of introduce yourself and share with us your leadership top tip and then we'll bring things to a close? Uh, yes. So um, I'm Roger Weatherby, Chief Executive of Weatherby's Bank. Um, we have what I hope is a 100 percent human and 100 percent digital bank. We, we, we absolutely look to look after people on the phone. We go and see them in their offices. We'll go and see them at their homes or whatever they want. You can pick up the phone and talk to us. But at the same time, we've got to have embraced that digital world and technology. And we do that in banking, investments, um, SME lending and insurance. Um, and my top tip would be, uh, and again, I've stolen this one, but culture eats strategy for breakfast. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The, 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 the very DNA and the culture of what we do means that we, we believe we'll attract the right staff. I think we attract the right customers. And that is what we've done and successful for them. So if you have the right culture, I believe that's, 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 that's the key to success in my, in my humble opinion. Brilliant. Roger, thank you very much indeed for being on Inspire Leadership. Stay on the line, we'll have a chat, but uh, I've really valued this and I know those people listening around the world will do too. So thank you. Brilliant, thank you, Jonathan.